Everybody good? Everybody can hear me? Yes. yes. Um, but yeah. Man, it's good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, we made it another Wednesday. I feel like it, been t- it, it, it took a long time for us to come on a Wednesday. I don't know why. It's like, been like two weeks or something. It felt dragged, no? I'm the only one? All right. Appreciate y'all. She said you're the only one. Thank you. Thank you. I needed that reminder. Um, no, nah, but it's good to see everyone here tonight. Um, you could have been anywhere else, but of course, you know, everyone walked into this place. Um, whether you was invited or whether you, you just felt prompt in your heart to come, I just want to tell you that uh, you're here by divine appointment. God brought you here, not your friend, Amen. not your, your intuition, not what you feel in your heart. God brought you here. And um, I thank God for his sovereignty and his power and his strength. I pray that the word tonight blesses you all the same way it blessed me. And um, as we continue last week's message, because we didn't get to finish, we didn't, even get to, we didn't even get to the slides, right? I pray we get to the first slide today. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity, Father God, to gather with your people, Lord Jesus, um, in a room, Lord God. We know that the church is beyond the four walls, Father God. We know that we are the church, but we thank you for this building in the name of Jesus, Lord. There's many people all around the world, Lord Jesus, people from Africa who watches us online, people from Canada and all these other places that they're not able to gather the same way we're able to gather together, Lord Jesus. So we thank you, Father God, for your grace and your mercy and your sovereignty, Lord. I ask that you bless this room, bless every individual in this place, Lord Jesus, whether they came with confusion, heavy in hearts, brokenness, or, or, or just looking for a way, Father God. I pray, Father God, that they encounter you tonight in the name of Jesus, Lord. I ask that you eliminate my emotions, my thoughts, and whatever it is, Father God, that would get in the way of your spirit, Lord Jesus. Use me tonight, Father God, to empower, to encourage, to teach, to convict your people unto you, Father. We thank you, God. We bless you, Lord Jesus. For those that are watching us online, our Father God, I ask that you be with them as well, Lord God. I pray that there's no technical issues, Lord Jesus, that they're, they're able to grasp every word that comes out of my mouth, Lord God, knowing that you are speaking to them as well. We thank you, Jesus. We exalt you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you made it. Hey, look at... Amen, man. I'm glad y'all made it too. How about that? Um, so last week we started, a, we started a new series. The new series that we started last week was called Be Ready, if y'all remember, right? Last week we, we started the series, um, but we only got to the passage and we never got to the slides. And the slides get, get in more depth as far as what we are talking about. I believe that we're living in a time that Christians are, are, are sleeping, I really do believe that. I believe that uh, America has not grasped the word of God in the sense of they don't understand what's about to happen in our world today. Um, I pray, my prayer is that the eyes are open, your eyes are open, my eyes are open to those that are sleeping in, in their little slumber. I pray that for the stale Christian, for the individual that doesn't take their Christian walk serious, I pray that they're awakened and they come alive tonight in the name of Jesus. I pray that this word doesn't go back void. I pray that it lands on good soil. I pray that, man, change comes in this place. And then when we walk out of this place, man, people say, man, what happened in there? All they see is fire and smoke because we're on fire for the glory of God. Amen. Um, so last week we talked about 1 Thessalonians. If you can't turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. Um, the message last week has started with Be Ready series. This is what every church should be. You know, a, a lot of the times we, 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 we adapt the Western culture of what church should be. We, we get fascinated with the lights. We get fascinated with the programs. And we miss the purpose. Right? We're, we're so fascinated with, uh, with the stage. We're so fascinated with the speaker, how the speaker looks, how the, how the, how the sound sounds, all these other things. We're so fascinated with these. And we miss the purpose of what church really is. Right. So the purpose of this series is for us as individuals to be ready and to anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church in Thessalonica that that Paul established, we know that he established this church, whether it's three weeks or three months. He was in that city on his second missionary journey, according to Acts chapter 17, and he established this church. But because persecution arose, we know 
because we talked about this last week, persecution came upon him by individuals that were considered Judaizers or they were Jewish individuals that gathered together and they say, I don't like what he's preaching because his preaching doesn't go according to the law, which we know that he was preaching the gospel to these individuals to set them free from a law that was in bondage. They were in bondage too, but they ain't like that. They ain't like that. What he was preaching was contrary. They felt like the message of Christ was too simple for them. So what they did, they gathered up a mob, and this mob came, and they pushed them out of this, 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 this city, if you will. They pushed them out of this city because they didn't like the message that he was preaching. We talked about last week that there is no perfect church, right? If, 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 if you feel like uh, if you're a church hopper and you're looking for a perfect church, you, you might as well start your own church with your perfect self. Because... <laughs> Because it ain't no perfect people. In fact, I said last week, um, some churches are closer to the New Testament idea as far as, uh, as far as a church establishment, but there is no perfect church. The reason why? Because local churches are made up of individuals who are forgiven and were given grace. We all fall short to the glory of God, the Bible says, every day, whether you're in Christ or whether you're not in Christ. Right. So at least three times in this letter, Paul gave thanks for the church and the way that they responded to his ministry. And as, as he was there for three Sabbaths, the Bible says three Sabbaths, it could consider three months or it can consider three weeks. I believe it was closer to three weeks than three months. But that's nothing for us to argue about. Paul ministry in Thessalonica would be a fruitful one because not only were Jews um, delivered and, and they came to Christ, but Gentiles came to Christ. In fact, the Bible says, as we read last week, that they dropped their idols and they stopped serving idols and they started serving the one true God. And then we also we also said I also said last week that Paul wrote this verse, this letter to the Thessalonian church. He wrote it from a place called Corinth. Or, uh, or known as Corinthians, the book of Corinthians. He wrote it in, in, as he was ministering in the, the church of uh, Corinthians <laughs> in AD 51. And he, he wrote this letter, what prompted it, because he had a burden for the church that he was kicked out of, pretty much. He had a burden. He didn't know what their status was. So what he was, he, he, as he was there, as he got kicked out, he went to a place called Athens on the way of Berea. And as he went to minister to these places, he, he just had this incredible burden for the people that he just left behind. So what he did was he says, yo, Timothy, Silas, as I told you, he was not by himself. Timothy and Silas accompanied him, uh, uh, was a, yeah, they were pretty much with him the whole time, according to Acts chapter 16 and 17. And he says, yo, Timothy, Silas, go over there and minister to these people to make sure that they're strengthened in their Christian walk. Right. So they came back with good news. That's what we talked about last week. The good news was, yo, this church on fire over there. I don't, they, they received that gospel and they turned that city upside down. What makes this so, what makes this so significant because as we read the scripture last week, it says that, yo, this thing spread it all across the whole region. So it's not only in this place, it spread it all across the world, right? The, what, what's so interesting is that this place in Thessalonica was actually the, um, a cosmopolitan area. Right. This cosmopolitan area was a place that they used to come. Everyone from around the world used to come there and they used to trade their goods. So they made money in that place. So the reason why the, the gospel spread so fire so, so rapidly is was because when they came there, they saw that these individuals wasn't doing what they used to do back back then. So it brings a challenge to us as Christians. Are you still the same or have you changed? Is there evidence of your sonship in Christ Jesus? We talked about. Right. Yeah. Remember that. Right. So 1 Thessalonians provides Christian with the clearest pack, um, biblical passage in which we will read during this series about the rapture of the church, the coming of Christ. As individuals who call themselves Christians, it is evident that you have been snatched by the grace of God because you anticipate the coming of Christ. These individuals were not only, they did not only receive the word, they spread the word and they waited patiently for the coming of Christ, which us as individuals who consider to be Christians are we anticipating the coming of Christ? My brothers and sisters, it is evident if you watch TV. I say this every week because uh, my teacher told me a, a good person or a good teacher repeats himself. In fact, Jesus repeated himself often. He just flipped it in parables for you guys to be like, they don't get it. Let me flip it in this type of story. Let me flip it in this illustration. So good teachers repeat themselves. We as, in, as individuals who consider to be Christian, whether you believe or not, the coming of Christ is near. We, oh, I've been hearing that for a thousand years, not, 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 not like how it is today. 
Trust me, if, 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 if you're an individual that study biblical prophecy, I'm, I'm very in, um, specific, when, or should I say, I'm very um, intentional about biblical prophecy because that's something that, that got me to Christ. And I watch it and I study it intently. And I, as I see these signs and I see everything increasing, man, my, he's on his way. Yeah. I believe that the, wor- the world is being prepared. God is preparing the world. He's preparing his church for the coming of, of, of his son. And as we see what's happening in the news and all these laws that are going to be passed, man, the church is going to be persecuted like never before. And I just pray that the Western church, which is us in America, I pray that, man, your faith stands before the test of time, the, the time because, man... It's going to reveal if you really are saved or not. Paul knew that the people had been exposed to false teaching. Knowing that they'd been exposed to false teaching, he knew that there was individuals that were opposition against the word of God, which is the word of the gospel, which is Christ Jesus and the grace of God. He knew that these things were being attacked in that church. So therefore, that's why he sent a letter to them to encourage them and to motivate them to godly living. Us as individuals, man, we should be motivated. We should be encouraged when we get into the word of God to want to, to, want to, to, want to live a godly life, a, a life of purity, a, a, a life that is set apart wholly unto God. We're not doing it for people. We're not doing it for the church. We're not doing it for anybody else but God. And if you have to understand that because we do not, uh, we worship a holy God, man, a righteous and holy God. He is not your brother. He's not your sister. He's not your homeboy. I say that all the time because a lot of the times when we think about God, we try to bring his status down to our understanding. No, he is beyond our understanding. That's what makes him God. Yeah. He can never change. He knows all things. If he could get better, that means he, could, he wouldn't be God. He is a holy, righteous God, all-knowing. So Paul often um, gave hope to this church by the return of, the, uh, of, of Jesus. To motivate them to godly living, what he did was he said, yo, let me tell y'all something about the coming of Christ. Because this church, as we will read further in the scripture, this church was actually being deceived by false teachers as if Christ already came. And he he hasn't come yet. And they were worried because they felt like, yo, what what about my my, my family that's not believers? What about my brother that's not believers? Like, if Christ came, why am I still here? I'm going to tell you something. The only ones that would be, cut, would, be, would be caught off guard as far as for the coming of Christ for those that are not a believer. Those would be the only ones. If you are a true Christian today and you're, you're intently studying the word of God, in which we will see in a second. If you're intently studying the word of God and you have the desire, you have this devotion, you spend the time in the word of God and you're just seeing how the word of God is not correlating with the people of the world and, and some of the churches are practicing today. If you see those things, you would understand that the coming of Christ is near and it would motivate you to want to live a righteous, godly life before God. Does that make sense to everyone in this place? So I pray that this message or this series, what it does, it encourages you and it grows you in maturity. In fact, that's exactly what this message is going to do. So as we get into it, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. If you don't um, have the Bible, I mean, I encourage you to get by a friend who has a Bible so you can get in it, to, um, you can get in it together. And as I read to you all, I'm going to read to you all from the New Keep James. Like I told you, I get bougie when I'm in the pulpit. Um, <laughs> So the New King James, that's what we're going to go ahead and read from. If you, got, if you have any other translation, man, don't worry. It's going to match up regardless. Um, let me know when y'all got it. Y'all got it? First Thessalonians chapter 1, that's where we're going to start. Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's do it. So Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We told you that these individuals that he were talking to, they were actually Christian individuals that continue living an active Christian life. So that's why he addressed them in such manner. I told you that this church was only established within, within a, a, a three-week um, time period. And these individuals, yet they caught on fire because they heard the gospel message. So they, they, were, thriving for the, they were thriving for God. So and it goes like this, and it says, grace to you and peace from, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you last week, I love that he, he placed God and Jesus together because these both, both of them are on the same playing field. They are equal in deity. They both have authority. They're both one according to scripture, right? So we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith 
a labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. I told you that oftentimes when he prayed for these individuals, he was praying in a group, meaning Paul was an amazing man. I told you last week he was an amazing apostle, but whenever he can, he would run in a, with a team because teamwork make the what? Let's go. So as, as, as Christians, as individuals, it's not about the man up here. It's not about the man with the mic. It's about the teamwork in the church. We are the body of Christ. We're a living organism, the, body, the Bible says, meaning we're supposed to be active in the church, not just one person, everyone, because we're, living, we're a living organism, right? So he says he give thanks to them. They often, oftentimes he will pray for them in corporate prayer. But I love the fact that he says without ceasing, meaning without missing a day. He always prayed for them. And he says the word mention. You know, sometimes we get, we get to that state of, man, I, I don't know what to keep praying because you, you, you want to go ahead and you want to draw out prayers. No, he mentioned them. He ain't say, man, I'm, I, I sat there and prayed all day for you. No, I mentioned you to God because I gave thanks to God for you. You know, so it just teaches us, uh, uh, it just teaches us how to pray as well sometimes. Because sometimes people, they try to get all technical with these big words. No, no, they, sometimes you just got to mention that person. God hears you. He understands. He knows. So, and it says, um, he says, your work of faith, labor of love, patient of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our Lord God or our, yeah, our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, that your election. He was saying that all these things, because you're doing all these things, we talked about it last week, because you have the virtues of faith, love, and, 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 and peace in, in, in a sense, right? If you, because you have these things, I know that God chose you. Meaning, I know that God snatched you up out of, out of hell. I know that God snatched you from your life of living in sin. I know he did all these things because it is evident by your faith. It is evident by your love. It is evident by your patience and how you anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it. I see it. Hey, and when we read more, he isn't like, yo, everybody's talking about what you guys are doing. Can they say the same thing to you? Can they say the same thing about you in your Christian walk? Can somebody see you today and say, yo, that person is not the same? I don't, I don't even know who that person is. Let me introduce myself again to that person. Has anyone ever did that to you? You have to ask yourself as a Christian because the reason why we're called Christians is because the Bible says that we're set apart. In fact, the Bible says that we are, uh, uh, we are the light to the world. We are salt to the world. Meaning sometimes we salty to these people. But, but in, to a sense of we preserve them. Right? So... He says, knowing, beloved brethren, that your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. We, is, this is powerful because he says that the word of God did not only just come to you, you not only was a recipient of this word, but you felt the power of God, meaning the word of God is, more, is so powerful to the sense of it, it's able, it's, the message of Christ is able to change your mind, your heart, even your lives. And it's evident for these individuals. Their lives were dramatically changed by the word of God. And that word power I told you last week was in a sense, it was not in a sense of miracles. Many people would take that and they would say, oh, okay, they had miracles. They were speaking in tongues. They was doing all these miracles. No, it doesn't exclude it, but it, that, that word does not mean in the sense of miracles. What he's saying is it, it gave you the, the, the ambition or the, the mentality to keep doing. So that word power means to keep doing. So these individuals received the word and it was empowered to keep doing. And then I love what Paul says. He says, you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake and you became followers of us and of the Lord. I told you last week, Paul was not shy about saying, follow me because he knew exactly where he was going. So like I told you as last week, as Christians, do you know where you're going? Maybe the reason why many people are falling astray or people in your camp are not changing or their lives are not being dramatically changed, maybe because you're leading them wrong. Maybe, you're, maybe they see where you're going and where you're going is actually a ditch and they ain't trying to go there. Ask yourself as far as, as Christians because it was evident. So he wasn't shy. Paul wasn't shy. In fact, we know in 2 Corinthians, he says, imitate me as I imitate who? Exactly. So then he goes like this. He says, um, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, that you became examples to all. Everybody say, to all. To all. 
So not, not just one individual, not to my, just my brother, not to my mom, not to, to every single individual that encounters me, they, it is evident that I, they, they, they see change in my life. I am different to them. Right? So he says that they received the word in much affliction, meaning despite the adversity that they were going to encounter, they says, yo, it is worth claiming to be a part of Christ despite the persecution that's coming behind it. I knew that persecution was coming, but yet I still stood strong and said, I'm going to call myself a Christian. Despite that the world, my friends don't like me, um, I might lose my job, I might do anything, but despite any of that, I'm going to choose to stand firm in my faith. So despite the affliction, I'm still going to take this word. And watch this, he says, with joy. But watch this, with the Holy Spirit. Meaning your strength to endure doesn't come from you, but from God. Many of us, the reason why we keep falling astray and we're not strong in our Christian walk, because we keep trying to do it by ourselves. We keep trying to do it by ourselves. That's why most of us are still in, in, in our brokenness. A lot of us are still in our brokenness because we're still trying to do it by ourselves. Let me tell you something. If you allow brokenness to mold your identity, it's no longer you. It's a mask. If you allow brokenness to mold your identity, it's no longer you. It's a mask. What you've been through cannot define you. What you've been through cannot define you. It's the becoming that defines you. Because the Bible says, for the old has gone and the new has what? Come. So why are you focusing on the past to define who you are? The world will tell you, oh, learn from your mistakes. As you learn from your mistakes, but you don't stay there. <laughs> As Christians, we don't stay there. And I want to say something. Delusion, began, delusion happens, or yeah, delusion happens when we choose to reject the revealed word of God. Delusion happens when you choose to reject the revealed word of God. And as we would see right now, these individuals took the word of God and he, they allowed them to set them on fire for the glory of God. So it says that you became examples to all, like I said, in Macedonia, in Achaia, or Achaia, who believed for, for yeah, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, meaning like a trumpet, like a sound, like a loud ring, and not only to Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Meaning you shouldn't leave it up to the pastor for the individuals to come to the church and hear from the pastor. They should hear before they even walk in that door. That's how contagious you are. So don't just invite people. The problem is we're inviting people to church and we're not inviting them to Christ. That's why individuals don't want to come to church. Let's, let's, let's give them Christ before they come to the church. Because they come to church, they ain't, they're not going to understand the custom. And I told y'all before, man, a lot of the times, man, I'm going to say it, black and Spanish people, we creepy because we approach them with deliverance. You got to be delivered. They don't know what deliverance is. Like, they don't know those terms. That is foreign to them. Romans 8, 7 says that our minds are hostile towards God. We don't understand that terminology. Come to meet people where they are sometimes, man. In fact, most of the time. Right? All the time. So it says, from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. So the evidence that they're in a sound church, the evidence that they were being discipled correctly, was the fact that, they went other places, Paul went other places, and he didn't even have to say anything because they was already saying how good of a shepherd he was to them. Can people say that about you? Because the Bible called us all priesthood, called us all to be pastors in a sense. We're supposed to be leading someone. We're supposed to be shepherding someone. We're supposed to be discipling someone. That's why when you, when you take a message as, as, as powerful as the gospel, the reason why you're supposed to go forth and say the gospel message is because the power is not coming from you, but it's coming from God. But a lot of the times, the reason why we, fought, we, feel, we feel timid when we try to evangelize to an individual is because we're trying to do it based off our own merit and not allowing God. You know, sometimes I tell y'all, it's not about, in this, in this specific manner, it wasn't even about the message. It was about their lives being transformed. 
If you can't say your testimony to an individual, but yeah, you can gossip, you can talk good about yourself on social media, you can do all these things, but you cannot say the one message that changed their life forever, something's wrong. So it goes back to doing spiritual inventory, which was emphasized last week. So the goal of this message, once we finish this message and we go through these sides, man, is for you to do spiritual inventory in your life to verify if you're truly a Christian and you're saved or not. Because in order for you to be ready, first you have to be a Christian, right? So there was individuals, seven women, I would say, in the book of Matthew, if I'm not mistaken, they all had lamps. And, and, and the Bible says that Jesus gave this message and he was telling them, yo, I'm going to come. That's, I'm just illustrating it in my way. He says, I'm going to come. And he says, it's going to catch many people on, off guard. Five was ready, two weren't. Why? Because their lamps, their lamps wasn't lit. So ask you, do you have fuel in your lamp? Do you have oil in your lamp? Or are you still stale in your Christian walk? You still dry. And then you ask yourself, when, when somebody says, man, come up and trust Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't want to go up because you feel like I've been up there too much. Well, obviously, it still ain't click yet. You still need to come up here. Change starts when transparency, that's when it starts. Transparency brings change in your life. Not pride. Pride, is, 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 that comes before the fall. So in every place, your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Right. And then it says, and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. If you have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not just anticipating the coming of Christ. But watch, you are delivered from hell fire. The Bible says the wrath to come. Watch this, whether we live or we die, glory to God. But as individuals who consider to be Christ followers, let's be ready. That word, as far as them being ready, or that word that they turn from, to, to God from idols, that word initiates repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. You cannot say that, man, God, I feel sorry for this, or I feel, in my mind, I, I feel like I don't want to do this, but you're, you're, you, you still continue to do it. No, that's worldly sorrow. That's fake repentance. True repentance develops into change of action. I am no longer going to do this. The Bible says the moment you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, what's do, is the one who gives you the strength to refrain from doing these sins. Because even the Holy Spirit will be grieved, the Bible says. He is grieved every time you fall into to sin. That word grieved in the Greek means he weeps for us as if someone died. So every time you sin, it's, it's as if someone's dying on the inside. That's why your Christian life is stale. That's why you're dying in the inside and you feel so... You feel so bad and you feel so uh, as if, man, like, like, hey, man, I, why I, I keep doing this? And you fall to your knees and you pray out and you cry out to God because the Holy Spirit is prompting you to, man, come clean to God. So that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. So they anticipated the coming of the Son, of the Son which is Jesus, who delivers us for the wrath to come. So let us get to the slides. I pray that you got your pens and your, everything ready. So we can go through these slides. But first, I want to give you all some statistics. Is that cool? Yes. So um, as far as statistics, right, these individuals, they caught on fire and they started spreading all across the world. Right. Um, in the 1910, right, in ni around 1910, the, the, the most Christians were pretty much generated out of Europe, out of the UK. So in the 1910, the majority of Christians came from that area over there. So statistics says Christians take up 33% of the earth population, meaning that's 2.4 billion people consider themselves to be Christians since 2012, right? And then it says they are, um, there are more Christians in America than any other continent. More individuals who consider themselves to be Christians more, in, more than anywhere around the world. Since 1910, we have increased from 36.8% from 27.1%. So we've been increasing as far as individuals who consider themselves to be Christian. But don't celebrate yet. Um, in the 21st century alone, 10.2 million Muslims converted to Christianity outside of the United States of America. 10.2 million. 
Last year in, uh, alone in Iran, two million came to Christ. And right now they're hiding in dungeons underground from the Muslims from being persecuted. The individuals that choose to, to, to count the cost, 10.2 million out of those 10.2 million individuals, they were willing to risk it all. Their families, their lives, their kids, they didn't care because they were dying for a cause. Can we say that about America today? Can we say that about your Christian walk today? You as an individual, let's not br- um, broaden the spectrum, let's talk about the people in the pews today. Can you say that about you? Because I'm telling you right now, persecution is coming to America. It is going to fall. America, it, 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 we can't save America, but we can save Americans. Yes. Yes. So if you're a Christian that needs to be saved, tonight is the night. Don't waste no time. So watch, and it says this, it says the number of Bibles sold or given away or distributed in the United States every day is 168,000 a day. Watch, 20 million Bibles are sold worldwide in the U.S. alone. 92% of Americans um, own at least one Bible, whether it was a gift or it was a purchase. But watch this, only 12% really reads it. But yet individuals would say 33% of the population in America or whatever it is, but yeah, they consider themselves to be Christian. But statistics says only 12% actually reads their Bible. So you're telling me that there's a lot of these individuals who think that they're saved, they're really not saved. Because true relationship is is, um, expressed through your devotion, through your desire, and through, watch this, your anticipation. I'm going to make a bold statement, man. If your pastor is not preaching Bible prophecy, he has missed the whole point. Because the Bible in itself is made up of two-thirds of Bible prophecy. You need to run from that church because he ain't teaching the whole counsel of God. He's just trying to keep you in that pew. He's just trying to make you look good. He just wants you to dress up and walk out there and be all good and go do what you keep living your life, living however it is without motivating you that the coming of Christ is near. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and you are sleeping and you're slumbering. And you're dying because they're dying. And it's evident by the statistics. That's why nobody reading their Bible. So Paul, seeing the church, he, he, him feeling concerned about this church, he says, yo, I'm going to motivate them by the coming of Christ. They need to understand that Christ is coming soon, so you need to live a godly life. And we'll get into it through the series in itself. But then statistics says the Bible excluded um is excluded from the best-selling book list because it would always rank the highest. So the Bible, they don't even measure, they don't even say the best-seller no more because they will rank the highest, right? But I believe that was done purposefully, right? So, and it says, um, with the average American owning, watch this word, nine Bibles. One person in America that considers themselves to be Christians, they own nine Bibles, but then statistics says only 12% is reading it. That's scary, I bet, I bet some of y'all in here are like, man, how many Bibles I got in my head? <laughs> so, <laughs> so to see, statistics says the Bible is um, popular worldwide, with, um, which matches the statistics indicating that Christianity is the most fly, followed global religion in the world. So the way that Bibles are being sold and being um, distributed worldwide, it proves that Christianity um, stands against the test of time. Over any other book, any other religion, Christianity always stood a message over 6,000 years old. Right? So, and it says that um, all across the planet to be exact. And it says the Bible sales bring in an estimate of 425 million a year. With Americans purchasing, watch this, 25% 25% of that sells, but yet only 12% actually read it in America. Um, I believe when they did statistics, statistics earlier, I would say in the earlier 2000s, um, actually right after 9-11, they said that Christianity skyrocketed. Everybody was in church, right? <laughs> Everybody was in church, and they, they said that um, the United States alone probably measured up to 82% as far as Christianity. Now that, that has declined to about 60%. Where individuals who grew up in the church, right, who left the church, young adults, majority of young adults 
no longer believing in anything. They just, just, just floating by. They believe in the deity. They believe there's a God, but they just don't know. So they says, I'd rather stay in between. It just reminds me of a story when it, when it, when it says that um, there was a devil on the right side and there was a God on the, right, uh, on the left side. And then he says, you have to choose a side. And the person said, no, I'm going to stay on the gate. The devil says, that's my gate too. That's why Jesus says, man, I will cough you. I will spit you out of my mouth for being lukewarm. You're not even of me. Man, we have no time to be in between. It's either you saved or you're not, or you're or you ready to devote yourself to God. I'm going to tell you something, man, you're not missing out, man. <laughs> I'm sorry whoever told you that uh, Christianity is boring. I'm sorry if you looked at other, other individuals and you imitated them and they were too religious, too hyper-spiritual. I'm sorry, but relationship or should I say Christianity is not based off the person, persons, but it's based off of one person. And his name is Jesus. He is capable to set you free. He is, he's capable of, of healing you from brokenness. He's, he's capable of breaking down chains, barriers. You're addicted to lust, I can take that. You're addicted to porn, I can take that. You, you, you have insecurities in your life, let me take that. You need a new identity, let me give you that. That's the Christ we serve. I don't know what everybody else is telling you. I don't know what prosperity gospel they're telling you. That ain't the God of the Bible. There's one Jesus. He died on the cross. He rose on the third day and he could set you free tonight in the name of Jesus. That's the gospel we proclaim. We won't proclaim nothing else. You can't feed no prosperity gospel into them people in Madagascar where these people are hoping and waiting for God for food. But you want to tell them that you, you sow a seed and you can get, man, come on, man, get out of here with that. There's only one gospel message, man. Let's get to y'all. Yeah, let's do it. Y'all ready? Y'all got your notebooks? <laughs> So what characteristics of this church made it so, so ideal and such a joy to Paul's heart? One, they were elect individuals. It was proof by the way they acted, they were, um, by the way they, they, they were on fire for God. They led by example. They were enthusiastic people, individuals. When they received that word, they said, yo, somebody has to know. The people must know. We can't keep this to ourselves. And then they were expectant people. The reason what made them so, uh, the reason why they expected God, because they had patience to expect. So they had those virtues of, of faith, love, and, and just hope. They hoped and they, they couldn't wait and they anticipated the coming of their Redeemer. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the elect people. The word church in 1 Thessalonians means a called out people. Meaning we're not just a, we're not just a, a church building. We're individuals that were called out from darkness. We were snatched by the grace of God. So therefore, we live as we were snatched out from the dark world. Whenever we read about a call in the Bible, it indicates divine election, meaning you didn't come to God. God came and snatched you. Right. And it says God is calling out people from this world, meaning he don't want you to stay in this world because we understand that this world is not our home. Seven times in the book of John chapter 17, our Lord referred to believers as those who the Father had gave out of the world. Meaning you were not meant to be in this world, but you were made to impact this world, if you will. Because we were snatched out by the grace of God. You were chosen. And it was displayed by the, by the death of Jesus Christ. Y'all got this? Paul stated that he knew the Thessalonians had been chosen. I'm sorry, y'all. Chosen by God. The doctrine of divine election confuses some people and frightens others, yet neither respond, it, response is justified. Understand this. We would never understand the total concept of election this side of heaven. When you try to figure this thing out, you would never figure it out. You won't understand how God chose you and called you. Because then individuals will make excuses. Why would God do this? And why would God do that? Who am I to question Oh, almighty God. Right? And it says, but we should not ignore this important doctrine that is taught throughout the Bible. The Bible says that you were chosen. Thank God you were chosen out of here.
Oh, to me, to me, to answer a question like that to individuals, man, I'm glad I don't know everything. <laughs> That, that's what makes God God. You know what I'm saying? Me trusting in God. The evidence is in my life that's been changed by the gospel message. It's not about, I don't need to know statistics. I don't need to know scientific methods or any of those things. Although science is in the Bible. Like, people have to understand that. Where do you think science get this concept from? You know, they say the Big Bang, God tells you, I created all things. So they're going off with an assumption. They think that this would happen. Uh, this, nothing made nothing. No, I'm um, something. No, that's impossible. God says, I spoke, therefore it came. Science will tell you Big Bang. They will tell you that something exploded and it made everything. No, that doesn't make sense. But when you go to the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, he, God says the spirit of God was hovering. And then he spoke. Light came. You know what I'm saying? Things were, came and manifested because God spoke it into existence. For me, to, for me to grasp that, or for me to, as an individual to debate individual, I don't debate them. I just give them my story. This is what God has done for me, and he could do the same thing for you if you simply just believe. Sometimes the thing is we make things so complicated because we want to see a drastic change. I told you all last week, man, your job is to plant seeds. Planting a seed by telling your story, the testimony. So if you, if you don't have the answer, you did the best thing. I, I don't have it, but I'll find out for you. That's the best thing you can do. But intently look or ask for wise counsel. Individuals that, that's what they study. Like I could point you a few individuals that would probably be able to talk to this individual and debate them because that's the, that's the best thing about the body of Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I would say, so you would say like, all right, other do what um, I did, it would be like, all right, just tell your story. Tell your story. That's, that's all you're called to do. The, in these individuals in, in First Thessalonians, the reason why they were so contagious is because they knew that these individuals were idol worshipers. They, they, they went to this place, they knew these people were bowing down to statues and all type of things. And when they seen a drastic change that these individuals was worshiping the true God, they were like, yo, yo, something different about this person. So people have to look at you and they are like, man, there's something different about Sophie. She's not the same. It's, like, it's, like, it's evidence in her life that she has changed. I want to know where that change come from. The enemy will come and try to bring doubt in you with individuals that simply don't understand. But it just goes back to scripture. The Bible says that our minds, um, the individuals who are in darkness, their minds and their hearts are hostile towards God. They don't even want God. God chooses those individuals. How? By the word of God. So your job is to plant the word of God because the spirit of God is going to go ahead and do what he's going to do. Say it again. For example, like, let's say somebody who, I don't know, the friend to you, oh, no, he wasn't that bad. Like, you know, when people feel as if they got to have some macho mommy or macho poppy testimony, oh, I used to shoot people, oh, I used to yeah, rob people, I used to do this, I used to do that. But really, you know, they did, um, to God is big, of course. There's no such thing as a white lie, little lie, little this, little that. Everything is just a guy. But what do you say to a person who's battling where they feel like, I would still share my testimony because it's not, it's like, the thing is, I guarantee you if we go all around this room, not everybody's testimony is a crazy testimony. You know what I'm saying? Not everyone in this place, but I guarantee you your story will resonate with somebody else's story. You could reach somebody that someone else can't reach. The thing is, the church has become this thing of competition of, I bet my story better than your story. Uh, what? What? Where did this come from? You know what I'm saying? Like, what? It, yeah, battle the testimonies, man. I said... I said a couple of months ago, I seen people, Christians, promoting, like, hey, go vote for my testimony if I can win $10,000. What? They selling testimonies out here? Like, what's going on? Like, I never, I never like, knew, you know what I'm saying? Like, to me, to me, individuals who do that don't understand the concept of the gospel. These, these individuals very well might not even be free because they have no story to tell. Because they don't know the gospel. You know what I'm saying? They don't understand what true freedom is. So I, I would, uh, man, I would, evaluation, man, spiritual inventory. I would say, you said this person is a Christian? Yeah, like, let's say this person is a Christian, and they feel like, man, my friends don't see no change in me because they think I wasn't that bad. It's all, okay, so just as a Christian, like, one thing to understand, like, my, my best example was, um, I was talking to somebody regarding um, Texas, and um, they didn't understand. 
understand his nature, but I've known Hector, and I can understand his nature. So when that person says that, oh, I believe Hector feels this way towards me, I could direct him to the fact that, no, Hector feels this way because I've known him and I've been in situations like that before. So when it, in terms of this Christian, it's the fact of they don't necessarily know who God is, right? So it's a perspective thing, not only a perspective thing, an identity thing. Because God sees sin equally, right? And, but it gets to the people say that, right? But they don't necessarily understand that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So there's many different things where in, in our human, in, in our nature, dang, I got to make this short. So where we are in this world, we view sin as, bro, murder, rape, all this up here. You know what I'm saying? Lies, a little bit of, you know what I'm saying? A little bit of lust, you know what I'm saying? No, it's not that. that. Yes. It's genuinely not that. A little cuss here, a little cuss there. It's not that. Right? But God means that as, as this, I, stop making more judgment. That's what it is. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's, they, they have, yeah, they have to come to the understanding that all sin is equal in the eyes of God. There is no sin greater. Everything on the playing, the, the same playing field. I, th that's a, that's so when it comes down to predestined, I would say um, yes and no, because God calls you answer, so He chose everyone, but most people are not answering the call. So God chose every single person. Yeah, so he calls everyone, you reject the call. Y'all got this right here? Um, so obvious facts about divine election. One, salvation begins with God. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Uh, according to 2 Thessalonians, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, John 15. The Father, oh, he the Father has chosen us in Christ before the foundations of the world. So you were chosen. You have to answer the call. Their entire plan of salvation was born in the heart of God long before man was created or the universe was formed. You were called from the beginning. That's why the Bible says that when you were in your mother's womb, I molded you and crafted you. So that's why individuals who, who have kids, they need to be stewards of their kids as well and lead them in the ways of God. Yeah. Why? Because you would have to give an account for your kid because God entrusted that individual in your life. So the way you lead them, that's the way you're going to be judged based upon. So as, as individuals who have parents right now, man, show grace and mercy to your parents. Because they simply don't understand, even if they treat you wrong, even if you always constantly get into fights and all those things, man, you pray and you love your parents. Because we're called to do so. Parents, um, kids, obey your parents. That, that's a command from God. Y'all got this? Second thing is salvation involved God's love. God loves God love made Calvary possible, Romans 5, 8. And there Jesus Christ died for our sins. But it is not God's love that saves the sinner. Watch this. It is God's grace that saves the sinner. God in his grace gives us what we do not deserve. And God in his mercy does not give us what we do deserve. So it's by his grace and his mercy that we're able to even sit in this place today. I promise you, man, if we really think about all the things that we have did to offend God, I promise you, man, a lot of us will probably be on our knees repenting unto God. It's just the, the, the reason why a lot of us are not taking God serious because we do not yet know God. Why? Because you're not even in your word. Only 12% in America are in their word. Don't let that 12% not be you. Y'all got this? The third thing is um, salvation involves faith. For by grace we are saved through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. The Spirit of God used the Word of God to generate faith, Romans 10, 7. Paul called this sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 
So your job is to say the gospel and the Holy Spirit is the job to go ahead and convict the individual and therefore bear much fruit for the glory of God. It is not your job. Your job is to plant the seed. God who grows the seed, waters the seed, sanctify the seed, and use it for his glory. That's why God gets the glory and not man. <laughs> Salvation involves the Trinity. Christians believe in one God existing in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We must keep in mind that all three persons are involved in our salvation. All three. This will help you escape dangerous extremes that either deny human responsibility or dilute divine sovereignty. Meaning you are incapable of doing anything on your own. It was all God. Everything. God sent the Son. Jesus died. Holy Spirit convict and regenerated you as a Christian. God chose. Christ died and the Holy Spirit convicted with the word of God. I told y'all a couple of weeks ago, the Word and the Holy Spirit, they go together. They're twins. Y'all got this? Some of y'all looking nervous. I don't know. Um, the fifth one, salvation changes the life. How did Paul know that the Thessalonians were elected of God? He saw change in their lives. So you have to ask yourself as we go through this list, your work of faith, your labor of love, patience of hope. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, people who wait for his son Jesus from heaven. Are you those individuals? Can you say that? Can people say, man, I know he's changed because look at his faith. Despite of, I still love. Despite of, I still have patience and I hope. Christ ain't come this year, but I pro he probably come next year. He probably come tomorrow. We don't know, but I'm still anticipating his coming because I know he died for me and I know, man, I can't wait to be with him. I told y'all a couple of weeks ago, what makes heaven heaven is not the pearly gates, is not the, sil the gold floor, is none of that. It's Jesus. Meaning if you can't get in the word now, if you can't love Jesus now, what makes you think you could be in heaven and experience or enjoy Jesus? Your job as Christians, man, is to get into the word of God and fall in love with the God who saved you. You can't say he saved you. You can't say you love him if you're not even in the word of God. The proof is in the pudding. You can't even, you, it, it, you have nothing to show for. There is no relationship. You can't, you can't say, man, I, I pray a lot and I do this and I just feel close to him through emotional attachment. No, the word and the spirit goes together. What you feel is emotion. We need devotion. A lot of people say, man, I, I, man I'm praying for God to deliver me. No, it's not about, you don't need deliverance, you need discipline. You're over saying, you, just, you saying, man, I keep falling into this sin. No, you need to discipline yourself. You're over praying for deliverance. God gave you the tools for your deliverance. It's right here. Y'all got this? What's up, Camo? Say it again. Because laboring of love is doing it for Christ and not for the people. Because people will let you down. But when you do it based off of God, when you do, you're laboring in love, even if they treat you bad, you still love them. I ain't doing it for you anyway. I'm doing it for God. Glory to God. If you're affected by an individual and you stop doing because of that individual, then you were never doing it in love. There it goes. Y'all got this? Oh, what's up, so? What are some practical steps that you would give someone who wants to do or is just a person? It first starts with desire. Yes. Yes. First starts with desire. From desire, it goes to discipline. From discipline, it goes to devotion. Three Ds. Three Ds. There it go. The three Ds. Discipline, yep, it goes from desire, discipline to devotion. And I'll add another one in there dependency. Um, a person who claims to be one of God's elect, but whose life has not changed, is fooling himself. Those whom God chooses, he changes. If God has chosen you, he's going to change you. You're not meant to stay the same. This does not mean that they are perfect, but they are possessors of a new life that cannot be hidden. 
Let's read that again. They do, it does not mean that you're perfect. It means that you're a possessor of a new life that cannot be hidden. It is evident that you have changed. Faith, hope, and love are the three cardinal virtues of the Christian life and the three greatest evidence of salvation. Faith must always lead to works. It has been said we are not saved by faith plus works, but by faith that what? Works. It's evident that you have faith because you do for the kingdom of God. You speak, you anticipate, you show love, you labor, you do all these things. It is evident that you are saved. When people see you, they'll be like, man, that's a saved brother. That's a saved sister. Yeah, yeah. I don't even want to go around that. You ever some, some <laughs> friends ever said to you, man, I don't want to hang around them because you're too churchy or too religious? You ever had that person? That's good. You should be religious too. Uh, that's how I feel. Whatever. Y'all got this? What's up, Will? So can I look at it? Um, I thought you was praising the Lord. Sentence that says like a person who claims to be a Christian or God's child, uh, but who is not changed is fooling himself. Yeah. He read the same exact thing that was on there, no, but we're gonna. A lot of people say that. Oh, uh, I, I'm Christian, but stop the cap. That then it is some better. You're lying. Like you're lying to yourself. <laughs> I'm mad that he just tried to speak in Spanish, but yeah, I missed oh, that. I said it. Oh, I know what I said. See, look, Don back there saying, don't ever do that again. Like, <laughs> but a person who claims to be one, a person who claims to be one of God's elect, but whose life has not changed is full in himself. Um, there's evidence of your salvation. There's evidence of your sonship because you're not the same. Once you encounter, man, I promise you, once you encounter the word of God and God has literally came into your life, you will no longer want to do the things that you used to do. There, there's something different. I, man, I want to devote myself to God. I, I finally understand his love for me. So therefore, I love him even more. That's why the Bible says that God loved you. That's why you can even love. Meaning we don't even understand love. Unless we understand that God loved us. What? <laughs> then, then, then it goes back to the first statement. They're just fooling themselves. They're fooling themselves. That's how I know that you're not in the word of God because that's contrary to the word of God. The word of God pushes the emphasis of transparency. It, it pushes the emphasis of why you have to gather together with the saints. It pushes that. Y'all got this? If the Thessalonians continue to worship their um, dead idols while pro uh, professing faith in the living God, it would have proved that they were not among God's elect. Love is also an evidence of salvation. The love of God is, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. We are taught by God to love one another, 1 Thessalonians. We serve Christ because, he loved, because we love him, and this is the labor of love that Paul talked about. The reason why we serve in the church, the reason why we do these things is because we love God and we want to do everything for God. The same way for a relationship. The reason why you love that, the reason why you do whatever it takes for that person to satisfy that person is because you genuinely love that person. So therefore, it's, it's the same thing with God. Yeah, I got this. Then, then you need to do, huh? Then you need to go back and understand the concept of grace because you were unlovable at one time too. A lot of people, a lot of people like to, a lot of people want to be recipients of grace, but they don't want to dispense grace. It's, it's twofold. When you have, when you receive grace, you're quick to give out grace as well. Trust me, if I, if I had a, if I had a notebook full of people. <laughs> If it wasn't for the grace of God, um, y'all got this?
Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. The Bible says that um, first, but we always miss that first part. The first part says, humble yourself to God. What's keeping you away from God is your pride. So the Bible says, submit, humble yourself, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. When was the last time you confessed? Does that make sense? Yeah, I got this. Um, if you love me, you keep my commandments, John 14, 5. The third evidence of salvation is hope, waiting for Jesus Christ to return. Unsaved people are not eagerly awaiting the Lord's return. In fact, when our Lord catches his church up into the air, unsaved people will totally be surprised. Faith, hope, and love are evidence of election. These spiritual qualities are bound together and can only come from God. So an individual, the evidence of your sonship, the evidence of your salvation is individuals who eagerly anticipate the coming of Christ. I don't know no Christian that has not been changed that doesn't, can't wait for the the coming of Christ. In fact, I know individuals that, man, they they can't wait so bad that they're, 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 they're so, um, they're in so enthusiastic or, or enthousi- they have so much enthusiasm to want to share the gospel because they understand that the coming of Christ is so near that they go out and they spread the gospel everywhere to every person. Individuals like this is evidence that they're saved because they anticipate it. If you are not saved, of course, the Bible says you will be cut off guard. You will be. And we'll talk about it during their whole series when we get to that point. Um, A local church must be composed of elect people, those who have been saved by the grace of God. um, One problem in our church family today, unbelievers whose names may be on a church roll, but they're missing out of the Lamb's book of life. We have too many people of church attendance, but they're not in God's book. I want you to understand something. When Jesus says, many would say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, he was talking to individuals that considered themselves to be Christians. He did not, he did not mention the unbelievers because these individuals are already, they're already set for doom. He's talking to the individuals that think, they have that assumption. I came to church, uh, uh, I, uh, my, my relationship is built on my baptism as a baby when they put the little water on top of my head. Like, I've been changed because of that. I'm saved because of that. I'm saved plus works. Grace plus this. Grace because of church attendance. I'm riding off of my grandma's devotion, my, my mom's devotion, my mom's commitment. Because of my mom's saved, I know I'm saved. No, no, no. Have you encountered the true Christ? You as an individual. Many would say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? He says, depart from, depart from me. I never knew you. He says, you who works, who does works of iniquity, who constantly, I mean, habitual sin, falling into your temptation, fall into your, you work. That's what you live off of. You thrive off of. I always say, I ain't going to say it. Forget it. Um, every church member should be example, his and her heart to determine where he or she has truly been born again. And belongs to God elect people. Spiritual inventory. It's important, man, to check your spiritual walk with God. In order for you to be a Christian that is ready for his coming or ready for whatever is going to happen, whether you're ready for death tomorrow, death today, or whatever it is, you have to be individuals that constantly does evaluations in your own personal life. Sit back and reflect, man. Hey, man, I could have done this better. I could have submit this to God. Why am I going off my will, my things? Man, Submit yourself to God. Y'all got this? Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, at the end it says, grace to you and peace. What's the Greek word for grace to you? You said in the end? Yeah, at the end of uh, verse 1. Oh, grace to you. I told you that I y'all last week, it means caress in the Greek. Caress? Caress, like charismatic. So it's caress. So the word grace in that is, is, is caress. And then the word of peace means shalom. 
So he says it in the Greek and he also says it in Hebrew. Yeah, that person, that person is very well deceived. They're very well deceived. An individual that anticipates the coming of Christ is an individual that's constantly doing. An individual that's constantly seeking the presence of God. An individual that's constantly out there speaking of God. It, it, faith without works is what? It is evidenced by your faith because it works. Oh, facts. 100%. I was one of those people. Individuals that would say, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, but still living in sin, like still doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember at one time in my life years ago, man, many years ago, I, I remember I used to talk about, oh, God is coming, God is this. And every New Year's, I would, I would pray to God. <laughs> Like in a state of repentance, but I never knew who God really was. And then after, after I see that the end of the world was a New Year's, the next day I'm living my life all good, like it's all good. But that was, that was deception because I was deceived in that state. But now that, now that when you're regenerated by the power of God, man, you see things from a whole different view. And you see your flaws. Exactly. What's up, so? All right, so a local church, is, it has to be composed of individuals that are thriving on fire for God. And it's evidence that they're elect because they're on fire for God and they're on one accord. Does that make sense? It's not a set of, 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 of perfect people, but of, of individuals who were saved by the grace of God. So, and that want the same thing, unity. There is, no, there is no confusion in the church. Everybody's on the same thing. Yeah, I know Christ is coming, so therefore let's do. Does that make sense? So you can tell an individual is elected by God or chosen by God because the way they live their life. They don't look at sin the same no more. Everyone's on one accord, although they're not perfect people. I want to get that through you. There's no one perfect. If you're looking for a perfect person, you need to go isolate yourself on an island with your perfect self. There is no perfect people at all. There was only one perfect man. His name was Jesus. He came and he fulfilled and he left the example for us to follow. We will constantly fall. That's why we have to come to the state of repentance. That's why we have the Holy Spirit who will guide, instruct, convict us unto righteousness. Convict us. Like, put it like this, man. Jesus, God is coming back for people that look like his son. That's what he, he's coming back for. That's why Jesus says, when he, I died for you and you trusted me as Lord and Savior, I clothe you with my righteousness. Meaning when God sees you, he don't see you. He sees his son. You were saved by the blood of Christ. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Um, he's, Adam, where are you at? He was hiding in the bush. Oftentimes when we saw, fall sin, we hide from God. It goes back to um, Jonah over there when he says that, man, I, I, you know, I feel like I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. that it's, that's normal when you're in sin. You hide from God. But God, by his grace, he already knew what he did. He asked him what you did. Why? Because transparency sets you free. So what God, when, it's not that God didn't know what he did. 
What God did, it was an invitation to set you free. Confess what you did. The woman gave. No, no, no. I instructed you. Stop pointing to somebody else. That's what we do often. That person did this. No, no. You're in charge of your own actions, Adam. Does that make sense? So as a church, a local church must be composed of elect people, individuals that are on fire. It's impossible for you to be around sound teaching and you still stay the same. Something wrong with you. Like you're not looking at yourself. You're still pointing at somebody else. The message ain't for your brother. The message ain't for your sister. The message is for you. Take that message in. You, I remember um, at one point when I first started reading the word of God, I used to read the word of God for somebody else. Then and, until, until God man convicted me and was like, yo, that, that word for you, I'm talking to you. You know what I'm saying? So when we read the word of God, we don't read the word of God for knowledge. We read it for an encounter. There would be a lot of changed individuals if they read the word of God, not for mere knowledge, but for an encounter with God. So God wants to speak to you, man. He wants to love you. He wants to show you who he is. Does that make sense? They're not, the, the thing is, everyone's elect. They just have to answer the call. Okay. The thing is, elect, and elect in the sense, there is this thing of called free will. So this is the thing. We won't properly understand the concept of election. Okay. We won't properly understand it. We just know that God chose, he called, you answered. Okay, okay. It's like this. I shot you a text message. It's on you to text me back. Okay. Does that make sense? It's on you to I'm calling you, but it's on you to answer. You can ignore me, ignore me for years, but one day you're going to answer that call. It's either yay or nay. That, that's, ex, that's exactly what it is, to a sense. Then they, then they have not read scripture because that's the being defiant against scripture. He going against scripture because the Bible's in the book of Hebrews says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Meaning, I'm not saying, um, don't, he's saying this is something that you're supposed to be doing. Accountability is in the gathering of the saints. That is a command from God. That is not, that's not a, hey, if you want to. That's a, a command. It shows that you're an individual that's changed because you desire to be around God's people. Individuals, individuals that are church hurt is because they have not grasped the concept of God. They're still looking at people. They're putting people on pedestals and not God. So the problem is people, that's why it goes back to people keep trying to give people church instead of giving them Christ. There's a difference. You can't, you can't, you can't win somebody over with church. You win them with Christ. We have to learn how to point people back to Christ and not the church. Because we're all fallen people that are saved by the grace of God. Although there's other individuals that would imitate God into a standard. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, we have to remember that we're all fallen creatures. No one is perfect. Even the man with the microphone, no one is perfect. But we can't use that as an excuse.
Well, we, we, and we have to be careful with that doctrine, though. Because that will place us in a place of complacency or, or contentment. As if, oh, God already knows, so why am I going to speak to that person? No, no. God utilizes every individual. We're instruments of Christ. We're finishing the work that Christ left behind for us to finish. We're instruments of Christ. And if you're chosen, if you're elected, and your life has been transformed by God, it will be evidence because you're doing for the kingdom of God. You have this burden. You understand that what I have, they need. It goes back to the concept of stop being greedy with your salvation. We should not be greedy with a salvation, something that we experience, a change that we experience. Does that make sense? It's like you got this gift. And while you're getting this gift, you want to show the world your gift. Me, when you get kicks, right, some shoes, some sneakers, you, want, you can't wait for you to have the right outfit for everybody to see you in your sneakers. The same thing when it comes down to salvation. You have a gift that everyone needs. There's a sense of urgency, man. There's many people that we bypass every day, family members, friends, that are going to hell because they have not heard this message. Or if they heard it, they didn't understand it. And you could be the, you could be the very well that change in that person's life. Does that make sense? And, and, and that's, to me, the problem, that's the problem with a lot of the church in the West, which is us in America, is because we're so filled with apathy. We hear this message all the time. We hear the gospel message, but yet we have not fully grasped it. It's like, oh, I heard it. I heard it. So they're filled with this apathy because now individuals in the West, in America, they, we have itching ears. We want to be motivated. We want to do this. I don't want, I, I like where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? Because they have not fully grasped the, 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 the Bible. So it makes sense that only 12% in America is reading, actually reading their Bibles. But yet every American statistics say they have over nine Bibles. You know what I'm saying? So it makes sense that we have a generation of itching ears. Who's going to bring that change? So you have to ask yourself, am I a part of that change? Am I contributing to this apathy or am I bringing change? You know what I'm saying? Hell, hell is a choice. Just like love is a choice. You choose to love that person. Hell, um, love is a choice. Hell is a choice as well. Um, I know we're not going to finish the slides. We didn't even get to the second one. So, so what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to go on to the next message next week. What I'm going to do is, I want y'all to get, whoever wants the notes, I want y'all to get with Ruby so he can take your information so he can send y'all the notes. I'll give y'all everything on this slide. On the house. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm gonna give you. <laughs> I'm gonna give y'all everything. I'm gonna give y'all everything on this slide, and um, 
And, and next week, we'll go forward with the message. Amen? Amen? Let me see if there's one more slide. So, yeah, so it goes back to, it goes to part two, which is people that lead by example. So there's four, there's four of them. So you know what? Next week, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead. Because I knew questions was going to come up. I already knew it was going to go based off the first slide. So y'all get with Ruby. Ruby, raise your hand. Show them who you are. Ruby will take that information. He'll send it right to you. Ruby got all the notes, and he'll send them right to you. And um, let us go ahead and let's close out and pray then. Let's stand up. <laughs> Glory to God, though. Questions, right? It's not bad. Hey, Don, come up here and minister with me, man. So before we go ahead and close out, man, um, when it comes down to, like, everything that we spoke about, man, we have to understand one thing, man. The evidence comes in your doing for God. It's not something that you can create on your own. It's not something that you can contribute. It's something that is a natural thing that happens. When you trust Christ as Lord and Savior, man, you experience true change, true freedom. Amen. And it's evident by the things that you do. When it comes down to the election, we can't focus on the election because if you, were, if you believe in Christ today, it's because you answered that call. And, and the evidence of you being saved is the evidence of you answering that question, am I really saved? There's some evaluations that you need to do in your life as far as spiritual inventory. The reason why I call it spiritual inventory, because there are certain individuals that are fooling themselves, thinking that they're saved, but yet they're living in habitual sin. They're constantly doing this sin in their mind. They're like, oh, I feel bad about it, but whatever. Then you're fooling yourself because true repentance leads to a, not only a change of mind, but a change of action. So the call is tonight is, did you answer that call? Did you answer that text? If you felt like um, tonight the message in itself was like a message to you like, yo, I need change. I know I haven't been living up to that standard. Then th this call is for you because all we want to do is just pray for you. It's, it's not to embarrass you or anything. I don't care how many times you came up here. I don't care how many times you came to the front at a church service. I don't care what it is. What we care about is your soul the most. The purpose of us sitting in here is for us to look like Christ, right? For us to know that we answered the call. For if Christ comes tomorrow, we're individuals in this room. We're anticipating and we're ready for the coming of Christ. Can you say that about yourself? Or the contrary? So, head down, eyes closed. If you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and tonight you feel like, man, tonight is the night. I just want true change and I just want true accountability. I want individuals to help me. And guide me. I, I, really, I really desire this change. And, and I know I haven't been ready. I know I'm not living up to the standard that God has called me. But I know that tonight I really do want change. I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand real quick. So we can know to call you out and we can pray for you. Not in the sense of, 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 of an embarrassment or any of that. If you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want true change in your life, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so we can pray for you. There's no shame because the Bible says that if you confess me in front of people, I will confess you in front of the Father. Jesus' words, not mine. If you're a Christian and you've been living a stale life and you know you want change, and you've backslidden many times, even tonight, you came in here sinning. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so we could pray for you too. Amen, bro. I see you in the back. Anybody else want to join him in prayer? You've been a lukewarm Christian your whole life. You ain't understand the Bible. You haven't even been in your word. In fact, last time you prayed was tonight. You ain't pray all week. You wasn't in the word all week. This, this message and this prayer is for you. So I'm asking you to slip up your hands so we can go ahead and pray for you. True change happens with transparency. Do y'all believe that? Amen, my brother. I see you. Amen, my brother in the back. I see you as well. I see you, my sister, in the front, in the front too. Anybody else want to join them as I call them out to go ahead and pray? I see you, my sis. Those individuals, man, I'm going to ask you to be bold and just come out the pew and just go to the middle in the back, and they're going to go ahead and pray for you. Just walk in the middle. You can just go around and go right there in the middle. You too, Ray. 
and they're waiting back there for you. They just want to go ahead and pray for you. They're not going to say anything bad to you or anything like that. They're just going to pray for you. Prayer changes everything, whether you believe it or not. I pray that this message, man, blesses you guys. I pray that everything that we talked about, every question that was, uh, that was said, every answer that was given, I pray that it resonates in your heart and it brings forth change. I pray that man, when people look at this ministry and they look at this church, they'll be like, man, those people came out of this place on fire for God. And it's clear by the way they act, the way they move, the way they move in unity, the way they love, the way they post on Instagram, the way they post on Facebook, the way they act in the store, the way they act in their jobs, the way they even order meals at um, McDonald's or Star, whatever it is, man, everything that you do, I pray that is an imitation of Christ and who he is. I pray that you guys, man, just... Be individuals that want to change the world. There is no time as far as more than right now that the world needs hope. And I'm confident, I pray that you guys are confident that no one raised their hand to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that you guys are that hope that the people need. Let's be imitators of Christ, amen? Let's go out and change the world for the glory of God. Why? Because the people must what? Let us pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I thank you, Father God, for your word that never comes back void, Jesus. I thank you, Father God, for even just giving us examples through scripture, Lord Jesus, how how to really be on fire as a church, Lord. How to be be lead by example, Lord Jesus. How to, how to go forth and just sound off, Lord Jesus, whether we look crazy, whether we be persecuted, Lord Jesus. I pray that these individuals in this place are bold in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray that their lives are dramat- dr- dr- dramatically, um, dramatically changed for the glory of God. God, I pray that when people see these individuals, man, myself included, Father God, man, they just fall to their knees in repentance because they understand that there is a God out there. I pray, Father God, that um, every person in this place, whether they came with confusion or doubt or whether they struggle with um, with lust, Lord Jesus, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's porn, whether whatever it is, Lord Jesus, brokenness, identity crisis, Lord Jesus, abuse, Father God, whether they even dealt with rape back then or now, Lord Jesus, I pray, Father God, for restoration in their life, true freedom in their life, Lord Jesus. I pray for change, Father God. I pray for forgiveness in this place. I pray, Father God, for people, Lord Jesus, that that are imitators of you and the word of God, Lord. I pray that these people catch on fire and have a desire to want to devote themselves to you, Jesus. Whether they have to discipline themselves to fast, Father God. I pray that these people in this room, they fast for you, Lord Jesus. They desire you more than they desire the church. Or they desire a a, a preacher or, or a sermon on Instagram or whatever it is, Lord Jesus, or a motivational speech, whatever, man. I pray, Father God, that they desire you more than their career and their family members. Because we know what scripture says, man. The Bible says that, man, you will leave your family for my sake. I pray that we are those people. Despite the persecution, despite the adversity, despite the ridicule that we would experience in our jobs or in our schools, Father God, we will serve you. And to your coming, Lord. I pray that we are people that are expecting the coming of Jesus Christ. I pray that we get excited in the name of Jesus that you're coming. I pray that one day we're going to, we, 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 we just see your face, Father God, and we just fall to our knees, Lord God, understanding, Father God, what you have done for us on the cross, Jesus. I pray that for these people, Lord, myself included, Jesus. I ask that you guide them, teach them, Father God, convict them where they are, those that are watching us online or on our YouTube or in our podcast. Father God, I pray for them as well. I pray for the, the technology, and I thank you for it, Lord Jesus, because of the technology, we're able to spread the gospel to the world. So we thank you for it, Father God. Not, not let it, don't let it only stop through there. Allow it to start with these people in this room. Professional seed planters for the glory of God. I pray this and I release them in the name of Jesus. Amen.